The Big Short, Inside the Doomsday Machine is a non-fiction book written by Michael Lewis and published in 2010. It is about the development of the real estate bubble in the United States throughout the 2000s. Michael Lewis vividly recalls his experience working as a trader for the Wall Street investment house Salomon Brothers when he was 24 years old. Because he believed the society to be absurd and unsustainable, he decided to make an effort to describe it in his first book, which was titled Liar's Poker. To his astonishment, Wall Street is constantly changing, to the point that the frenetic pace of the 1980s seems positively archaic in comparison. Meredith Whitney, a financial analyst, has a conversation with Lewis shortly after the subprime mortgage bond bubble bursts in 2007. During their conversation, Whitney provides Lewis with a list of people who accurately predicted the crash and who were able to profit from it by taking short positions. This is the very first time that Lewis learns about Steve Iceman. Iceman was a contrarian from the very beginning of his time spent in the financial industry. He begins his career as a financial analyst, where he rebuffs the urge to bestow positive evaluations on businesses that do not merit such accolades. His panache wins him fans, some of whom ultimately follow him to his new investment business, Front Point Partners. Vincent Daniel, a cynical trader from Queens who becomes Frontpoint's head research person, and Daniel Moses, a colleague of Iceman's at his former job who becomes Frontpoint's lead trader, are two of his most essential team members. In the meanwhile, Michael Burry is a neurosurgeon who, in his spare time, maintains a financial blog that has garnered an unexpectedly large amount of attention. He finally launches his own company, which he names Cyan Capital, and succeeds to entice so much capital that he is forced to reject potential investors. After having some hazardous bets pay off, he gets interested in credit default swaps as a strategy to wager against the subprime mortgage market. This is because credit default swaps allow for more leverage than traditional bets. A trader at Deutsche Bank called Greg Lippmann develops a concept that is similar to Burry's, and he tries to market the idea to a variety of traders all across the world, including the group at Front Point that is led by Iceman. After expressing a significant amount of early skepticism, Iceman ultimately decides to work with Lippmann. During this time, Jamie Mai and Charlie Ledley are developing their very own garage band hedge fund. They started with a very modest investment of $110,000 and have now grown it into a sizable fortune. They make use of a method known as event-driven investment, which often entails betting on improbable outcomes in which experts have neglected to account for the risk. Ben Hockett, a former trader at Deutsche Bank, has joined their team as a partner in order to provide their fledgling business a greater air of respectability. He brings with him a wealth of industry knowledge in addition to a pessimistic outlook on the future. All of the prospective traders in the big short realize via their own studies that there is something seriously wrong with the market for subprime mortgage bonds. The fact that these bonds are based on mortgages that have a very high probability of failing is being masked by banks via the use of complicated techniques that obfuscate the truth, even from the banks themselves, which, after enough people default, will make the bonds worthless. Even bonds that are meant to be secure are constructed on foundations that are unstable, and this is primarily due to the fact that rating agencies do not appropriately examine the composition of the bonds. When it's all said and done, 
they all find themselves together in Las Vegas for a massive conference of people who purchase and sell subprime mortgages. They all walk away with the understanding that the traders who are long on subprime mortgage bonds are fooling themselves, and that they need to raise the amount of subprime mortgage bonds that they are short on. At first, the traders involved in big short incur losses on the short bets they take. Particularly challenging for Burry is the opposition from his investors. As a result of his son's autism diagnosis, he comes to the conclusion that his own difficulties in communicating with potential investors may also be caused by autism. The crash, on the other hand, is unavoidable the longer time goes on. When the news emerges that the stock for Bear Stearns, which is a big Wall Street corporation, is swiftly plunging, Iceman is physically on stage delivering a discussion about difficulties in the market. This is the first indication of a more widespread issue. The big short traders are all scrambling to protect themselves from potential financial losses as a result of the crisis. After everything has settled down, each one of them will have amassed great fortunes and will have seen their forecasts proven correct. While certain traders, like Iceman, make terrible forecasts about the demise of Wall Street, the United States government finally steps in to save a large number of significant banks and prevents them from going bankrupt. The traders featured in the big short are ruminating on their next move now that they are no longer considered outsiders or underdogs, and many of them are feeling high levels of worry about the current situation of the globe. Some people, like the traders at Cornwall Capital, consider moving their money into assets with lower levels of risk in order to protect it, while others, like Burry, seize the chance to leave the financial industry completely. At around the same time, Lewis extends an invitation to John Gutfreund, his former superior at Salomon Brothers, to join him for lunch. Gutfreund was once referred to as the King of Wall Street, and he was responsible for paving the path for a number of dangerous activities that directly contributed to the financial disaster. Nevertheless, despite the fact that they have every reason to be antagonists toward one another, Gutfreund is courteous to Lewis, and Lewis can't help but be charmed by his tough-talking former employer. If you have any suggestion of which book I should summarize, please let me know in the comments, and if you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe.